The sixth and final session of the 2021 Ohio Beef Cattle Management School was hosted via Zoom by the Ohio State University Extension Beef Team on February 22nd. During the concluding session, OSHA Extension Beef Field Specialist Garth Ruff discussed a variety of ways cattlemen might improve profitability in a cow-calf enterprise, including utilization of superior genetics, capitalizing on seasonal marketing trends, and calf management strategies that add value to individual and groups of calves. Listen in as Garth shares insight into maximizing feeder calf values. All right, we're going to spend the next uh, talk here talking about, you know, we, we, we've talked about getting cows bred, uh, managing some genetics. Dean just give a nice presentation on the economics, making call cow decisions. Uh, so let's talk about the calf side of things here as we wrap up uh, this 2021 cow calf school. So I think there's some things we need to think about being a cow calf producer. And when it comes to being improving in profitability, a couple of those things, you know, what does it take to be a high return producer? I'm going to kind of define what a high pr producer is in today's marketplace. We need to think about calf management. What we can we do from a management standpoint? Uh, and then how do we capitalize on genetic progress made in, in the beef industry? We'll spend a little bit more time on management, specific management considerations, genetic considerations, and we'll talk more on the marketing side uh, and some of that seasonality that Dean mentioned that with regards to cow prices. We also see similar trends in terms of feeder calf prices throughout the year. We to be critical of our operations. Why do we do things the way that we do? Are we being profitable? Are we, do we do it because it's a least cost uh, formula? And I'm not saying that least cost is bad. There are some least cost producers that do very well. Is it because of tradition? This is the one I think we struggle with the most. You know, you can see the picture there, the running of the bulls in Spain, you know, Tradition, just because you've always done it, doesn't mean it wasn't incredibly stupid. Uh, I think we can let tradition impede improvement uh, to, to an extent in our operations. Is it convenient? There's certainly value for convenience. Are we not sure why we do things the way we do them? Uh, but let's focus on profitability here for the next few minutes. This is my oversimplification of what high return cow-calf producers do. And that is that they produce the type of calves that the feeder wants to feed, the packer wants to process, and the consumer wants to eat in an economically sustainable fashion. All right. Uh, oftentimes when we talk about the cow-calf enterprise, you know, hopefully we can get a return to capital. We may or may not have a return to land and labor. Uh, so producing quality feeder calves uh, that have a place that have value in the marketplace. And the reason we talk about being economically sustainable and profitable is that there is a cost, an annual cost to keeping and maintaining a cow. Uh, here in Ohio, this is some cattle facts data. You can see what that was from 2016 to 2018, uh, depending on weather and rainfall, anywhere from 590 to 630 bucks annually. That puts us kind of somewhere on the average in this kind of Great Lakes region, as opposed to some other region of the country where rainfall and feed and forages uh, may be a little bit more challenging limited. So here's a straw poll that I normally ask you for in an in-person program. What is your calving season? Is it a spring? Is it a fall? Is it a combination of the two? Uh, are we that 365 days a year that Al talked about last week? What is our weaning age? Are we weaning at 205 days? Are we weaning at 100 days? Of course, whenever we catch that calf. All right. How long are we letting those calves be weaned before we market them? Is it somewhere zero days? We wean them on the stock sale. Zero to 28, 28 to 45, 45 plus. We're going to talk about the, the value that weaning brings. Do you precondition your calves? 
do you utilize an enterprise budget and have marketing goals? All right, we have enterprise budgets here at Ohio State uh, on our farm office website. Take a look at those. Uh, plug in your own numbers. I think Al showed an example of one here last week. Uh, those are tools that can be of good use. High return producers don't compromise animal health, nutrition, and genetics. We'll talk about marketing a little bit separately. Uh, but those first three all impact reproduction and fertility. And at the end of the day, you know, thinking back to Alvaro's talk, if we don't get cows bred, what I'm going to tell you in the next half hour is going to be irrelevant because we won't have calves to market. So we got to get those cows bred and capitalize on reproduction and fertility. Uh, so there's some good fat cattle facts data out there where they look at the, the difference between high average and low return producers. Uh, and this first slide is percent calf crop. Uh, you can see here our high return producers. Um, I got the thing here in my way, I can't see the top of the slide. Over the th last three different years, uh, 16, 17, 18, we can see that our high return producers get at least a 90% calf crop. All right, that's calves born, a percentage of calves born versus cows exposed to the bull. Uh, our average producers are somewhere in that 88 to 90 percent, and our below or our low return producers, uh, this is all based on survey data, are somewhere in the mid to high 80s. As we look at calving intervals, sort of, we see that the the bulk of our high return producers, almost half of them fall in a zero to 45 day calving season. So I'm gonna throw a poll up here. Now I, I wanna know how long your calving season is. Is it zero to 45, 46 to 60, 61 to 90, or what is a calving season? Because uh, as we talk about feeder calf value, we know that we give up a significant amount of pounds and we give up some uniformity the longer that we stretch that calving season uh, out. Uh, so we got about 60% response. I'm going to end it here. And it looks like the bulk of the answers are somewhere in 46 to 60 day window. Um, a few to 60 to 90. Once we get above 90 days, I think we got to start looking at the economics of, you know, even from a 90 to 120 day calving season. As we look at weaning weight sorted by low average and high return pr producers, uh, we can see here that it's almost consistent with, consistently, no matter the year, 30 pound increments. All right. So if we take 30 pounds at $1.50 a pound on our 550 weight steers that Dean mentioned earlier, we're looking at somewhere at $45 a head. Uh, separating our high return from our average pr producers. And then you can double that $90 a head, separating our high return to low return producers. As we look at weaning weight based on calving interval, this is where we come uh, in uniformity or the lack thereof once we get into those long calving seasons. Uh, calving season in a zero to 45 days uh, based on the cattle facts survey data from 2019. Uh, the weaning weight of those calves is somewhere around 560 pounds. Um, and once again, just figure somewhere around the buck 50, depending on the time of the year that you market, uh, and you can subtract the value of those calves there pretty easy. Let's talk about calf management. I'm a firm believer and the research and markets show that preconditioning pays. And we'll talk about some limitations that we see here in the state uh, and, and across the country with regards to being able to precondition calves. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to define preconditioning as a 45 plus day weaning, two rounds of a modified live vaccine. We're going to worm those calves. We're going to castrate any bulls uh, and, and sell steers. We're going to make sure we do any dehorning and that all cattle have a permanent ID. And you can see here on this slide, once again, from the same cattle facts survey, as they look at the, va the value of weaning length for calves that were weaned for at least 45 days, 
by far and away and were of higher value. All right. And interestingly enough, the, the cal calves that were shipped off the cow are of the second highest value. And I want you to think about why that might be. We know that calves shipped off the cow are going to face a challenge and we can manage those calves as a group as we face that challenge as they enter the feedlot uh, versus, you know, those calves weaned for a short period of time uh, where we don't know where they are in terms of uh, that challenge status. So I'm going to throw another poll up here. Um, how long do you wean your calves before you market them? You know, and, and even some programs, I think, you know, as we look at this, we can make the case for a 60, 60 plus day weaning period. Uh, certainly that's going to depend on the price of feed and the price and the value of the forage that you have available. So we're going to go ahead and uh, share those results here pretty quick. Uh, most of you have, looks like a 45 day plus weaning period. Uh, so you're capitalizing on that value. Weaning age, uh, I'm just going to throw some questions up there. Why do we wean at 205 days of age? Well, traditionally, that's been a purebred standard for growth EPDs. Now, of course, we can adjust those EPDs if we wean at a different age. Why 205 days? Uh, I want you to think about the history of uh, farming and, and livestock production. You know, that 205 day window gives us a time where, you know, not too long ago, we could calve uh, a group of cows, uh, go out and plant corn, bale hay, combine that corn, and then come back and wean those cows. Uh, physiologically, stand speaking, it's really not an ideal time to wean calves. Unless we've uh, got them weaned, we've got them vaccinated, or yeah, we've got them vaccinated because that innate immunity from the cow is at a low point. And then we're going to throw a high challenge at those calves. Uh, so that's why, you know, if we consider early weaning, there's some advantage. Uh, and I've got maybe just one slide here coming forward. Steers versus bulls. Uh, Kenny Burdine, we had him on here just a month or so ago talking about the value of, of castration. These are 550 pound uh, steer and bull calves from Kentucky auction prices 2010 to 2017. And he's got data up through 2019 at this point. But I want you to make note that steers outsell bulls every month of the year. You know, there may be one or two instances at the, at, at the sale at a given week, depending on the supply of calves that, you know, there's really not a whole lot of differences uh, in price. But at the end of the day, uh, month in, month out, and you can see the seasonality of calf prices there. Um, there's $11 a hundred weight bonus for castration. Well, you know, we get the argument, well, bulls grow faster. Well, here's a research study at Oklahoma State in 2001 where there was minimal, minimal difference in performance of calves if they were knife cut, banded, or clamped at a young age. Uh, so the type, the method of castration didn't have an impact on performance. Uh, and there was no advantage of the growth rate of bulls before weaning compared to the bulls that were castrated by any method at two to three months in age and given an implant. So in this case, they did supplement uh, the, the testosterone or you know the hormone to promote growth. Uh, and that can, that can be an option as well. A 1989 study, bulls castrated at birth, performed similarly, no significant differences to those castrated at four months of age, uh, indicated that leaving the bull intact for a period of time also did not increase performance. Steers versus bulls, looking at some of Kenny's data, uh, we got some price slides and the value of that additional weight. Uh, once again, for that to sell a bull at $11, 100 difference, or you can see the price slide there. Those bull calves on a 10 cent slide need to be 64 pounds heavier to bring the same total dollars as a steer and on a 15 cent price slide, 94 pounds difference. As we talk about vaccination, value through preconditioning, uh, really in the marketplace, you know, there's a difference between premium and discounts and what the expectations are. Uh, 
we, we can see that for zero to minimal vaccination, you're gonna get a discount, all right? As we look at source of age verified calves, all natural, some of our premium programs, um, there's actually a three to $17 hundred premium. And you can see here that calves vaccinated at least twice, about 75% of our average and high return producers get two rounds of shots into those calves. So the question that was in the chat, we can talk about some of those premium programs, whether they're all natural or never ever antibiotic free type programs uh, in terms of age and source verified. Uh, think of our dairy beef calves being way ahead in the ability to do this based on records and traceability. Uh, the question was about grass fed calves. Uh, do you have to have a premium in order to make up for uh, losses in performance and gain? Absolutely. Now I'm just going to caution as we look at some of these premium programs, you know, some years there's upwards of a $15 or hundred weight premium and other years it's minimal. It all depends on the supply uh, of these program type cattle uh, and demand on the feedlot side. Some, poten some potential limitations to preconditioning calves and we're well aware well, the biggest one in this part of the country is probably facilities. All right, we don't have a head gate, we don't have a chute, uh, and we're not going to get hurt processing calves. I understand that. But as we look at the economics, if we look at a $11 hundred weight premium on that 550 pound calf, that's 55 bucks a head. All right, and if we would just castrate 10 calves a year, make 10 bull calf steers, that's a premium of $550. If we just look at a simple head gate, uh, you know, a calf crop and a half, two crops for a 22 cow herd. Uh, we can look at purchasing a head gate. You know, facilities don't have to be fancy, they have to be functional. Uh, look at a bud box and, you know, throw together a chute to get to this head gate. And the return on investment is pretty quick. When we talk about considerations for lot size, of course, it's going to be dependent on cow number and our ability to produce uniform calves. Uh, and part of that goes back to that whole discussion about calving window, your, your calving season, the length of a calving season. Uh, here in Ohio, we know we're already at a disadvantage when our average herd size is 17 cows. Uh, and in our economic talk with Kenny Burdine there, uh, in late January, he showed some data where groups of five to 10 significantly outsell lots of one to three. And there's even a premium for selling groups of three as opposed to selling singles. Uh, and, as, and as our cattle are marketed through the stockyards or wherever, uh, if they're going to, into a feedlot somewhere, that magic number is that semi lot load of 48,000 pounds. So I'm going to throw a what if scenario out here to you. Uh, what if our neighboring, our neighbors, neighboring producers with 20 to 30 cows uh, each work with each other to market their cattle? Obviously the key here is going to be consistency and that starts with consistency uh, in terms of genetics, our breeding and calving season, management such as preconditioning and castration, and the ability to pull and sort these calves in order to market a semi-load. Uh, now, certainly there are things to consider, uh, freight, logistics, who's going to buy your cattle, who's going to handle the money, those type of things. Is it a crazy idea or is it doable for our small herds? Well, I just happened to stumble upon this uh, 2007 article from Jason Ahola uh, out of Beef Magazine, and it, and it talks just about the process of pulling calves, you know, somebody has to initiate that pool or, or that program, you know, uh, secure member producers. Um, of course, there's the business side of things, you know, what, what does that need to look like from a legal standpoint, you know, and determine cattle characteristics. At the end of the day, the cattle need to be uniform um, in terms of breed. Uh, sex, age, size, those type of things. How are you going to sell those cattle? Uh, how do you time the sale of those cattle? Are you going to sell them 
um, with a set delivery date that's got to be agreed on by all parties, determining the base weight and price uh, and that calf management piece. And a key to selling uniform calves uh, and, and what happens at the, you know, at the stockyard or sale barn, if that's where you sell your cattle, is they've got to sort them. All right. We talk about medium and large frame cattle. Cattle have those abilities to finish upwards of 1,300, 1,400 pounds in the feedlot. Um, those are certainly going to be at a premium versus those small frame cattle uh, that are going to finish upwards of 11 to 1,200 pounds in most cases. Then we look at muscling score, all right? Ones and twos, I think are, you know, more than acceptable. It's when we get into those threes and fours uh, in terms of muscling, those cattle, you know, that are maybe more suitable, suited for grass to put on some cheap gain, some compensatory gain, um, all things to consider when we're talking about selling uniform lots of cattle. So once again, uh, preconditioning pays, you know, that wean for 45 days uh, and some that cattle fax data yielded a $98 a head premium. There's a value to having cattle started on feed. All right, cattle need to learn to eat out of a bunk. And if they've been weaned and started on feed, uh, that learning challenge, uh, as far as learning how to eat out of a bunk, once we get to the feed lot, those cattle are get, gonna get on feed uh, earlier than those calves that have yet to eat out of a bunk. As far as castration, earlier the better. Uh, we know, once again, there's some value to that. I'm gonna throw a pull up here. Now, I'm just for curiosity's sake, how do you castrate your calves? Are they knife cut? Are they banded? Are you clamping them? Obviously, if you don't have facilities, uh, maybe you're not, performing castration. Uh, and if you have facilities and aren't castrating, that's an interesting point in the conversation that I'd like to have. And it looks like most of you are abandoning your calves. 77% uh, uh, and that's completely acceptable. Uh, if you're using little bands, obviously that's easier when they're younger. If you're using a calicrate band or the easy band, you know, the only caution with banding calves is you got to make sure you get that tetanus shot in them uh, as you process them through the chute. Then vaccinating, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Kiefer, our animal science veterinarian here at Ohio State, is, is working with a group to determine what are those core vaccinations for beef cattle, both feeder calves and beef cows. Um, you know, I, I certainly believe that uh, bovine viral diarrhea uh, bovine respiratory, respiratory disease, IVR, are probably going to be some of those core vaccinations. Uh, and then we can also talk more about black leg and pink eye. Uh, you know, black leg more so in our cows. And pink eye has really seemed to be a challenge here in parts of the state over the last few years. So I've got one last poll with regards to vaccinations. If you want to go ahead and answer that one, do you give your calves one round of vaccine, two rounds, the full workup? Uh, once again, don't have facilities, or if you have facilities and aren't vaccinating, I, I, once again, I'd like to have that conversation to figure out uh, why that might be. All right, so most of our cattle are getting at least some sort of shot, right? Ideally, that two rounds, uh, you know, that makes up about 60% of the results. One round is certainly better than nothing. Uh, and when it comes to preconditioning, if you're not, you gotta do some advertisement on your own part, right? Uh, if you're gonna consign vaccinated calves to an auction, you know, that auction manager needs to know that those calves are vaccinated, preconditioned, weaned for however long and started on feed. Because um, if you don't do a little advertisement on your own part, that's all gonna get lost on sale day and you know may may not get advertised once again some potential limitations as we talk about facilities you know we need to have an area where we can separate cows and calves to get them weaned you know some sort of corral an alleyway a bud box we 
but you got to have good fence in between them. Uh, if we're going to look at fence line weaning as an option, uh, we've already talked about head shoots and gates, and of course, an area to feed those calves uh, with separate water access. Once again, there's a high return on investments for workable, not state of the art facilities. We need to consider safety. All right. We know that, and John Grimes and Dean both mentioned, you know, as they get older, breeding for docility, uh, docile cattle has become more of a priority. Uh, we know here in Ohio that the average age of beef producer or farmers in general is, you know, mid to high 50s. And working cattle should not be stressful. If you've attended a beef quality assurance session over the last couple of years, hopefully that's been emphasized. You know, I, I really like that picture on the bottom part of this screen, you know, old McDonald had a farm, had, uh, if you got those type of cattle, those type of cows in the herd, uh, they're kind of a no-brainer to be in the call pen. Records in a recent survey of Midwest beef producers, 77% have records matching cow to calf at birth dates. Um, that, that's really good, as opposed to 13% with no records you know, that permanent identification, linking that cow back to that calf uh, and knowing what sire, that can be, all be valuable information in a more intricate marketing system. Uh, if you're not keeping records, you know, we hear that, well, you don't know a good system to do it. Uh, there's certainly options out there. There's a variety of apps and software as we get more connected and more comfortable with that type of technology. Or, or we can still use the good old Microsoft Excel. Um, and that NCBA's Red Book, I, I think that's been used well, well over the years, something you can put in your pocket uh, and keep records on the go. Don't know which records to keep. Uh, if you're gonna keep anything, make sure you know how many, you know, keep inventory, how many cows that you had exposed to, how many cows after you've preg checked were bred how many cows were calved and how many cal cows, calves were weaned. And those are all important metrics when we talk about efficiency of a cow-calf operation. Of course, individual animal ID, uh, market weights, often not gonna be an individual weight, but weights of the group. Uh, we can keep records, you know, for rotating pasture, feed cost, sire usage, and look at uh, some of those enterprise budgets that stand as put in the chat. Uh, once again, don't let tradition limit you from adding value to your cattle. Uh, different isn't always wrong. Let's talk a little bit about genetics. Uh, typically, we would start with genetics as a in a presentation like this, but in terms of comparing genetics to management, genetics is always going to be tougher to change because uh, it takes time, right? But genetics are also very important. You know, so we can talk about genetics, you know, produce type of calves, packer wants to process, feeder wants to feed, uniform, bull selection. I think John and Alvaro have done a great job summarizing that. Heifer management, uh, you know, do, do we need to breed our own heifers, maintain heifers in the herd, or is it more cost effective uh, to purchase females? I think feeder calf price, uh, has a lot to do with that. Genetics versus nutrition, uh, the concept that I put in a lot of presentations, you know, and then not picking on any breed in, in, in particular. Uh, but as we talk about genetics and nutrition, you know, what has a greater influence on value? I tend to make the case for genetics. We know that, uh, there's a high probability that offspring from the cow on the right side of the screen are going to be more valuable than the cow on the left side of the screen. And kind of a take home point, you know, and a little bit tongue in cheek here, uh, but we look at uh, the football coaches, the football programs between Ohio State and Michigan, you give both of those coaches uh, some of the best high school athletes, some of the best high school football players in the country on uh, who comes out on top more than often. 
and on the football field, I like to think that uh, that success is highly heritable from, from a uh, program standpoint. Here's some survey data, once again, from Cattle Facts, looking at the value of a bull uh, on, on the bottom there and correlating that back to the value of the calves. Uh, and then the percentage of bulls that fall in that window. So I, I think this is pretty telling that the value of bull, uh, as bu bull value increases, the average value of that calf increased. You know, so that's putting an emphasis on genetics, putting an emphasis on performance in you know, highly desirable traits uh, versus, you know, just getting a cow settler uh, that will get the job done. But if we want to look at being a high return producer and increasing revenue, certainly uh, there's some value in investing in a bull. And there's even more of a case to be made when call bull prices are what they are. And you can sell your old bull that weighs a ton for somewhere from fifteen to two thousand dollars on a given week, fifteen hundred to two thousand, uh, and that makes that new bull purchase uh, look relatively cheap. And we can see here that about fifty-five percent of the bulls in this survey cost somewhere from twenty-five hundred to five thousand. Uh, slides from the twenty sixteen National Beef Quality Audit. You can see here. Uh, about 60% of the fed cattle being processed are black hided. Uh, there's a premium, you know, as we look at branded beef, certainly driven by certified Angus beef program. Uh, the premium for those cattle in the feedlot, even if it's four to five dollars a hundred, certainly adds up tremendously. And you see that in auction prices. Once again, we need to have medium and large frame cattle that can hang a heavy carcass. Uh, we can see here as carcass weights have increased over time. Uh, 2016 average was 860 pounds. Then we also need cattle from a genetic standpoint, and we've done a good job of this, uh, that have the potential to marble and grade prime and choice. Uh, I think as we go forward, we're not going to talk about prime and choice. We're going to talk about uh, top choice and prime as opposed to just making that low choice quality grade. And you can see here uh, the amount of prime cattle that have changed over time. 3.8% uh, the cattle in 2016. At one point in 2019, we were approaching upwards of 8% prime cattle. A little bit on marketing, you know, think about the options you have available to you to market your cattle whether that's through a private sale, hauling them to the stock sale, the auction market, retaining ownership. Uh, if you're thinking about retaining ownership in your 2021 calf crop, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to our cow calf outlook meeting uh, in Kenny Burdine. Burdine. What are the risks versus the rewards? Uh, you know, and are you capable of successfully marketing your cat, marketing your cat, or you, do you need the help? of uh, you know, that auction market, uh, that cattle buyer in your area. So long term, how cattle have traditionally been marketed from 2002, from 2016, uh, from a couple different sources we see here that still about 70% of our cattle are taken to a live auction, um, you know, 15%, 17% direct sales and the rest are made up by internet or videos, video auctions. Why do you market the calf, your calves the way you do? I think there's pros and cons to every scenario, uh, whether that's a sale barn, private treaty sales, or a video or internet auction. Make sure that you're capitalizing on whatever pros, uh, pros and cons for each system as they apply to your uh, cow-calf enterprise. <clears throat> so Dean talked about seasonality in the call cow markets, and there's certainly seasonality in the feeder calf markets as well. We can see uh, long-term, you know, this kind of seasonal index. Uh, now 2020, probably gonna be a little bit different line than what we've seen historically uh, due to COVID. But typically we sell our highest value calves somewhere between March 5th 
uh, in the end of April as calves go on the grass. <coughs> uh, then supply, calf supply often tells the story uh, with regards to value and, and fed cattle prices as to what that fall low might be. But traditionally that's when the bulk of the cattle were marketed uh, from a spring calving herd. So over the last 10 years, there has been an a, advantage to uh, marketing calves, even spring ca born calves in the spring where the market's paid on average uh, $282 a head uh, to add those additional pounds to capital, capitalize on spring prices. Uh, you can see there 2019, 2020, somewhere around $145 a head, or excuse me, at $145. Uh, dollars a hundred weight, that's $252 a head or 84 cents a pound, but we need to consider a break even cost of gain. As corn price goes up, this might change slightly. <clears throat> and once again, as corn price goes up, there's an incentive for the feedlots to buy heavier cattle as opposed to trying to put those extra pounds on in the feedlot. And with that seasonality in marketing, I'm going to propose a question, does fall calving make sense? This is all a research study Andrew Griffiths at the University of Tennessee, comparing retrospectively fall calving systems to spring calving systems. So we can see here just the difference in our breeding cycles. Typically our spring calves are from May to June, fall calves, uh, fall calving herds, December to January. We're gonna calve in September and October as opposed to February to March and traditionally wean in April and May when the cattle market hits its highs in late April, early to late April uh, versus weaning months of September and October. <clears throat> so you can see here the three studies that I've got circled uh, from Louisiana, Texas, and Arkansas, where they all showed some um, advantages to the fall calving systems. Uh, higher calving rates, lower calf loss, lower culling rates, and higher 205 day weaning weights. Now the kicker, here is and why I think the question needs to be asked, is there merit to fall calving? As we look at the weather trends here in Ohio long-term and Dean and I were talking before we got started here this evening, you know, we're going from white to brown pretty quick in terms of seasons here in the state. Uh, and if you don't like mud, I think fall calving might have its place. Once again, here's that seasonality of feeder calf markets peaking in March and April with our lows in October. So sometimes early weaning does make sense. It makes sense if we have limited forage availability, that way we can lower the energy demand on that cow. Because uh, when she's at lactating, her energy demands are at the highest point during the season. And she's gonna reach peak lactation in about 60 days. Uh, typically we don't wanna early wean any earlier than 100 days if the market rewards it. You know, if we need to wean a couple of weeks earlier uh, to hit those high calf those high calf prices in the spring and the fall calving herd, I think it certainly makes sense <coughs> uh, in fall calving cows to look at early weaning. And you can see here uh, their spring calving season and all the studies that they did evaluate. Spring calving calves were heavier than fall calving, both steers and heifers. But that said, the average price uh, in April and May was anywhere uh, from 11 to $9 a hundred greater. Uh, and you can see their net returns of 66 and 68, uh, or excuse me, those are call cow prices. Call cow prices that time of the year, uh, anywhere from eight to $10 a hundred higher. And there's that. Cow, uh, call cow index that Dean showed, or the historical index uh, is this red line, 100 is the average. You can see there that once again, from March to uh, oh, sometime in late July, 1st of August is when we sell our highest call cows. Uh, so we look at the net uh, comparing the spring and fall calving season. Uh, the probability of a positive return is almost doubled uh, 
depending on what our forage situation is. Uh, and, and these studies that were evaluated. Yeah. Our spring calving season with uh, no hay constraints, we had about a 50-50 shot of positive returns or profitability, net returns, uh, where we can, where that was increased to about two thirds of a chance uh, when we were not limited in forages. Fall calving considerations, you know, what are the nutritional demands of the cow and the calf? What type of forage is available to you? Uh, consider calf weaning weight, calving rate. Once again, that's the number of calves weaned, or excuse me, weaning rate, the calves weaned uh, per cow exposed to the bull, the seasonality of cattle prices, seasonality of feed prices, and of course, labor. Now, I'm not saying go out there and switch all your spring calving cows to fall calving cows, because it's going to be cost prohibitive. Open cows are certainly a profit drain. Uh, I think we've covered that uh, significantly here over the last few weeks. So with that, are there any questions? Is the economics of weaning later and shorter preconditioned period, how do, how do they compare to weaning at 205 days and a 45 day preconditioning period? Uh, so if you're gonna market yearling type cattle, there's certainly, the, certainly a premium for that 45 day preconditioning. Uh, as opposed to less than 30 days. Because once again, we're not quite past the cycle of where we got complete immunity and the challenge is still relatively high. If 205 day weaning weight is not physically ideal, what do we recommend? What are the standard lengths? So 205 days is the standard length. And if we're gonna wean cattle at 205 days, that's where that vaccination program is key where we wanna limit the challenge that those cattle face at 205 days and they have an adequate amount of immunity from the vaccinations uh, as we sell those cattle and remove the feedlot.